It's time for the Revival Now podcast with James Brandt right here on the Luke 418 radio network. Get ready to receive a word from the Holy Spirit. Get ready to experience revival. Praise God. Psalm 1611. Hallelujah. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Do you believe that today? At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, with the recent developments of the revival that's taking place over in Kentucky, anybody see that going on? Come on, I know you have. Amen. Amen. With the the recent developments there at Asbury University, I want to talk about what our goal is when praying for a move of God. But listen, they are actually stopping the meetings there. Have you heard that? They're stopping the meeting. So I don't know if they're going to move it, move it somewhere else, but they're stopping it. I, I guess the president said they got to get on with their normal business. When a move of God ignites in an area, it's like a burning bush moment. What do I mean by that? It means that those that stop, pay attention to what God is doing, and press in for it themselves, they will draw it into their own lives. They will draw it into their own churches and areas. Amen? It's a burning bush moment. Because if you haven't noticed or not, people are criticizing it, critiquing it. Some are like, yeah, go God. Yeah, or some are just totally ignoring it all the way around. So that's what I mean. It's like a burning bush moment. When God is moving. I mean, come on. When you got college kids... That don't want to leave a building because the presence of God is so strong. How can you criticize that? How can you criticize that? Amen. So those who criticize and ignore it, they won't have to worry about it because they won't partake of it. Amen. But listen to this. Don't expect the Holy Spirit to move in the same way in every location. I've been texting this out to you guys. I've been putting it on Facebook. And and here's the deal. In fact, the Holy Spirit will move in a way that will stretch you spiritually. Come on, I know all you quiet and shy ones and all that. You're like, yes, yeah, come on, Asbury University. Yes, they're just sitting there and soaking. But don't expect it to necessarily be like that in every location. Because the Holy Spirit wants to stretch us. That's what revival is. So, you know, here's the problem. So you got people who are paying attention to what God is doing. You got some people criticizing it. Then you got some people paying more attention to what the devil's doing instead of what God's doing. Are you following me? They, they need to shift their focus back on the kingdom of God. Now, Marianne and I, we went for dinner to Alan Jane's house on uh, Friday night. And so we had a great time. We're sitting in the living room. And it's toward the end of the night. And we just start talking about you know, it, different spiritual experiences that we've had in our life, right? And, and Jane starts talking about how when, I believe down in Tennessee, that they were sitting around in a, in a prayer meeting in a living room, and all of a sudden they felt a breeze come with the presence of God on it. And all of a sudden we're, we're in there, we're in her living room, and all of a sudden that breeze hits us. And the presence of God, like electricity, hits us. She starts cracking up, and, and just the joy of the Lord hits her. And we stand up, and we, I mean, this breeze is coming from one location, then from another. It was undeniable. My point is this when you focus on the kingdom of God, you attract the kingdom of God. That's why it's important to testify what God has done in your life. Because you're going to attract more of what you are focusing on and giving Him glory for. Are you following me? Does that make sense? All right. So, when we're talking about a move of God, we are suppo- what are we supposed to be praying for, right? Uh, what is our goal? What are we seeking? Uh, many Christians, they pray for a move of God, but they don't really understand 
uh, the dynamics and purpose of what they're seeking for. In other words, there's this. There's some kind of a longing in your heart. There's some kind of a longing for more. What is it, right? That's what I want to give clarity to you guys today. What is that longing in your heart? What really should you be seeking and asking God for? Amen? So I want to give you that. The title of my message is this. Are you ready for this? Invitation, Visitation, and Habitation. Oh, someone just got a glory bomb revelation right there. Invitation, visitation, and habitation. You'll know what I mean in a moment. We as born-again Christians have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, don't we? When you got born again, He came in on the inside, right? He took away that sin nature inside of your spirit. That's why you're no longer referred to as a sinner. You're a saint. Because the sin nature in your spirit, man, was taken away. Are you following me? That don't mean you're never going to sin because you still got to renew your mind. But that's your job. Are you following me? Say, I'm a saint, saint. not a sinner sinner. in Christ. Christ. All right. Now, listen, in other words, you're bent toward God, not away from him like the unbeliever. You following me? All right. So we are empowered and led by the same Holy Spirit that empowered and led the Lord Jesus Christ himself in his ministry. Uh, We have the same Holy Spirit that has raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. We have the same Holy Spirit that caused him to be ascended from earth and raised him up. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That's pretty mind blowing when you think about it. But when we're talking about an awakening, an outpouring, and revival, we are talking about not only the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, catch this. We're not only talking about the Holy Spirit moving in a person, but outside of us. Are you following me? In a move of God, the Holy Spirit works obviously inside of people to stir them up, bring them to repentance, give them a hunger for obedience, a revelation of the holiness of God, healing, deliverance, and all that good stuff. We know that there's a work inside. When praying for a move of God, we are praying for the Holy Spirit, listen, to move uh, in, in, around us, on the outside of us. And listen to this. There is no random act of God. Oh, let me say it again. A lot of lazy Christians just want to believe that. Oh, if God wants to do it, he's just going to do it. Right? Oh, that's just the sovereign move of God. He Come on, somebody. There is nothing random about God. He's looking for a partnership before God and man. Now, here's the deal. Here we go. Let's talk about the invitation stage. Say invitation. You need to understand this. I'm telling you right now, there is no random move or act of God. There is no random awakening, outpouring, or revival. Now, let me touch on something. Awakening and revival means to become spiritually awake or or to become spiritually revived, right? It's a coming back to your first love. It's those backslidden Christians. It's those that feel weak in the battle. There's a revive. They feel revived, fired up again. Are you following me? Okay. Okay, that's for backslidden Christians, those who become weary, all right? Now, an outpouring, on the other hand, it affects Christians and unbelievers. It is a, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh moment. Are you following me? Say outpouring. So obviously, all three things will affect everyone, but I wanted to break those terms down for you. Does that make sense to you? All right, so anytime there is a move of God, like we're seeing in Kentucky... Other places, the Azusa Street Revival, the Welsh Revival, the Cane Ridge Revival, all of these revivals that have taken place, they are not a random occurrence. Someone, listen, someone somewhere was praying for a move of God. Someone has to pray and believe God to move. Are you following me? There's nothing random. Many times, this is the importance of praying in tongues. Because in our natural mind, of course, we we pray for a move of God. But when we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit's praying the perfect will of God. And I guarantee you, he's praying for a move in a region, in an area, in a city. So that, see, what praying in tongues does, it bypasses your natural mind. Say bypass. Man, I like that bypass valve, don't you? Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all. Amen? So try to outdo Paul. All right? Here's the, here's the deal. 
it looks random to many. All of these moves of God, right? All these lazy Christians say, well, God just did it. He just wanted to do it, so he's going to do it, right? It looks random to many because they did not see that person that was pressing in in prayer. They didn't see the tears that these individuals had. They didn't see the hours that they, they stayed in their prayer closet for a move of God. In fact, you're born again because someone prayed for you. Are you following me? You're born again because someone prayed for you. Don't tell me prayer is not important. Amen? There, no, so get this. Catch this in your spirit right now. There must be an invitation from a person on earth for the Holy Spirit to move. There is nothing random about God. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Earth moves first. Draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. We move first. Are you following me? Revival, a move of God, is that someone drew nigh to God and he drew near to them, baby. Come on, somebody. He seeks a partnership with his people. And this spiritual law or principle is found in Matthew chapter 7. Go there with me. Matthew chapter 7. This is one of my topics. This is my thing. I am a revivalist. I like it. I like this topic. I like to flip things upside down or try to turn them right side up, as we talked about before. I don't mind stirring things up. I don't mind making people angry with the truth. Have you noticed that yet? It's been over a year I've been here. You guys notice this yet? All right. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Here it is. Very popular passage. Jesus spoke these words. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him that knocks, it will be open. Here we go. We must see, uh, ask, seek, and knock for a move of God. All right? Those three actions are all a part of the invitation stage. Are you following me? Say invitation. To ask, seek, and knock for something, you must first recognize the need and have a spiritual hunger for a move of God. There must be a heartfelt invitation and openness for the Holy Spirit to move by, uh, by a person or by a group of people in prayer. There's nothing random about God. I'm telling you that right now. The process of asking, seeking, and knocking must continue, here it is, with fervency, with spiritual hunger and desire. Something that you will not let, not let go. You will not stop until that move happens. If you look at all the revivalists of the past, all the people that God used in a move of God in a revival, they didn't let go until it came. Are you following me? We cannot let go. We're we're too lazy. We're too lazy. Jesus said, couldn't you pray with me at least an hour? That is what will manifest a breakthrough in your life. Say breakthrough. Breakthrough. Now, even the word breakthrough, doesn't breakthrough just shows us there needs to be some pressure, some pressure, a pushing through. Amen? Amen. Say breakthrough. breakthrough. We need to keep going until the breakthrough comes. And too many Christians stop way, just right at that mark when they're getting ready to break through, they stop. In fact, some of the, the most crazy attacks on your life will happen right before the breakthrough. I'm getting word that a lot of our intercessors in the church are getting attacked spiritually big time. Keep pressing in. Don't back down. Baby, we are right on the edge of something here. Amen? Here we go. So here's what you got to know. Asking is simple. You keep asking, keep asking, but that is entry level. You cannot stop at the asking stage. Are you following me? Seeking and knocking have different facets to it that we as Christians need to understand of why we are doing it. Okay. So when seeking God for an awakening, an outpouring, a revival, just whatever you want to call it. All right. Just a move of God. Can we just agree on that right now? We are seeking Him to move not only in the hearts of people personally, but outside of us, here it is, in a specific geographical location. 
I said a specific location. Here's what a move of God is. A move of God is he's manifesting on the outside. People get changed on the inside. It spills out of the four walls and it, uh, and it affects everyone around them. Are you following me? Does that make sense? So we're, when we're praying, and when we come together here in this church and we're praying in this building, we are trying and, and, and pressing into God, pour out your spirit in this location where we meet. So we can change the surrounding areas around us. Amen? Amen. That location could be a church building, your home, a workplace, a city, county, region. It goes on and on. Amen? It is a marking of the territory for the kingdom of God. All right? So we are praying or asking, seeking and knocking for God to manifest His presence, His glory in a specific location. That's what you're longing for on the inside of you. That's what humanity is longing for right now. To feel, to to be encamped by the manifest presence and glory of God. That's what they're looking for. That's what you're looking for. That's what your spirit man is calling out for. And you don't know how to pray. What am I praying for? This is what you pray for. Lord, fill this place Wherever you're at, your home, wherever you're at, in your car, fill this place with your glory, with your manifest presence. Are you following me? I'm interpreting what your heart is crying out for right now. We are pressing in to create an atmosphere of His presence, of His glory. Here it is. That can tangibly or physically be sensed by all in that location. How many of you felt the presence of God physically? You literally, you felt a tangible presence of God. When I came up this morning on the first song and turned the corner, it's like I walked into fog. It was just just a heavenly feeling. Like an electricity hit my body. That's what we're seeing. Oh, but we're not supposed to seek anything physically. Who told you that? Dead religion? Dead religion taught you that. I'm telling you, there's so much junk that dead religion has caught a, a taught us. So much. So this is what's happening in Kentucky and other universities, uh, you know, around the country. They are giving testimonies of physically, tangibly, here it is, I heard these exact words, feeling a wave of his presence in that building. Just a wave. It comes in waves. And then there'd be like, there's a lull there sometimes. You know, you'll, you'll look at the live broadcast on YouTube and they're just... You know, they're just singing a simple song and all that, and it's just real calm. Then all of a sudden, it's like a wave. You hear people, their voices get louder, and they start, it's like they're, they're riding a wave. It's like a glory wave that comes, a refreshing. How else do you explain kids not wanting to leave a building? The glory is in that place. That's what we're trying to create right here in this building. That's what we're trying to create. Amen? Pressing in for. That is what's drawing people, even not just those people at the university, it's drawing people from all over the world to locations to, uh, to want to just sense the presence of God. That tells me that, number one, the body of Christ is hungry for more. That also tells me they're not experiencing it where they're at. There's a lack. Say lack. So people down there are getting born again. They're getting healed. They're getting delivered, recommitting their life to Jesus. The glory of God in a a specific location creates the atmosphere of heaven on earth. Listen, it is an on earth as it is in heaven experience. That's what we're seeking in this place. And not just to keep it in here. We, Like I said, it will affect people and the people when they leave this building, walk off this property, they will, they, they will be so fired up and filled with the anointing and presence of God that they're going to lead others to Christ. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. That's how it happens. But at first, notice, it first takes place in a specific location. Say specific location. I can't get that, you know, I just, I can't hammer that enough. That's what we're trying to do. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But this is our goal and target of asking, seeking, and knocking. We want the glory of God in our midst. And like I said, that's what mankind is looking for. Because of that newfound, kindled, rekindled love and commitment, it's like 
that their perspective shifts. All of these, remember I talked about distractions last week. That's why the devil wants to distract you. He wants you to stop pressing in for the presence of God. He knows how powerful it is. That's why you see all the junk on television, all the junk on the radio stations. It's all about distraction. Stop pressing into the glory. That's what the devil wants. You following me? So human beings, they look for all these things through alcohol, drugs, sex, all these things. You're not going to find it. What you're longing for is the presence of God, the glory of God. Amen? So it is a powerful corporate and personal experience that spills out to other areas. I said this on Wednesday, but during the Welsh revival in the early 1900s, get this, they had to lay off police officers because people were getting too righteous. People didn't want to sin anymore. Bars were closing down. There was no crime. So they said, guys, sorry, we got to lay you off. We're not giving out any tickets to make, uh, you know, some money here. Uh, You follow me? All those speed traps out there. Okay, but I don't know. Am I the only one when I see a you know a 70 mile an hour sign, I always see ish at the end of it. <laughs> Has anybody ever seen ish at the end of that? <sighs> so seeking and knocking have an important aspect to them that is separate from asking for a move of God, all right? So now I'm still on the invitation stage. Say invitation. An important aspect of seeking and knocking during an invitation stage is this, praise and worship to God. Praise and worship to God. Seeking and knocking. So, so the entry level thing is you're just, God, you know, send this, you know, send this move of God. Send this. That's the asking stage. We need to do that, but that's where many Christians stop. Are you following me? Who's really committed and pressed in, press in to want to see a move of God? Who will press in to praise and worship to God? Come on, somebody. Prayer. Praise and worship to God. Here's what happens. Creates an open heaven, or or you could call it a portal of His glory. A window of His glory in a specific location. A Jacob's ladder, if you will. Are you following me? That's why it's so important. That's why we have so much prayer in this building. Because we're trying to create that. I mean, we know there's been prayer for years since this ministry has been going. But... I feel like we're turning it up a notch. Are you following me? We're turning it up a notch here. And we're in a season of breakthrough now. So we would be totally foolish to let it pass us by. Amen? So we're trying to create this open heaven, this portal uh, of the glory of God. Now, here's what happens. When there's an open heaven over a specific location I'm talking about, it's like this. It's almost like an enemy-free zone. That's why people who are in bondage to demons and all these things, they can come into a building where the glory is and it feels like someone took the chains off of them. And then they leave here and it feels like they're bound up again unless they get delivered in the place. But there's almost like a temporary (sighs) breath of fresh air. It's almost, I'm telling you, everything, when the glory is in a specific location, everything flows easy. Miracles, signs and wonders, people, your, your touch. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. I don't know how else to say it. The entire atmosphere of that location will shift from being boring or there a deadness in it to becoming alive and charged with his presence. It's like a, a direct, an open heaven of what we're meaning. It's almost like, like, over a location all the way to heaven, it's, it's the glory zone between heaven and earth. Are you following me? That's what we're trying to create. I mean, people at the revival in Kentucky, the students are saying, man, every time I'd go to chapel before this happened, every time I'd go to chapel, all I want to do is just look at my phone. I'll scroll on Facebook. It was, it's just boring. But when the presence of God came in, the phones were thrown out. Hands were lifted. And all they could do was praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're trying to create right here in Carroll, Michigan. Amen? 
to affect people. And in, in, we have people coming from a 50 mile radius or more to this place. So, so when you get touched here, you, you're like a little torch, baby. You're like, you're a flame and you're being sent out to your location to affect your city, your county, your workplace. That's what, see, I can, I'm the pastor. I don't, I obviously not working in the secular realm, but what I'm doing is I'm lighting little fires on you guys. <laughs> Come on, baby. There you go. Come on. I'm lighting fires and say, now go and let it burn. Amen. Oh, I've been in the secular world. Trust me. I know the challenges of it. It's horrible. I mean, you're going right into the enemy's camp. We need the glory. We need the manifest presence on us. You know, here's the deal. You can even break through to such a point. Kenneth E. Hagan, Ken, the founder of Rama, he's passed away now in 2003, but People would say he would walk into a store and the whole atmosphere would shift because of the anointing and glory over his life. He would be in a... One time there was a testimony. Someone went into a, a suit shop or something like that. And some, some students walked in and said, Whoa, I just felt the presence of God. And all of a sudden, Kenneth E. Hagan walked out of a dressing room. But that man paid a price for it. Say price. There's a price to pay for the anointing. Amen? Hallelujah. So the entire atmosphere shifts. So the enemy knows this truth, okay? And, and has his own counterfeits uh, to the, aspect, the holy aspects of God. See, it's a spiritual law. Listen, say spiritual law. That can be used for holy purposes for the kingdom or evil purposes for the, the kingdom of, of evil, of darkness. See, here's the deal. Listen, you've got to know this. I hate to talk about it, but you got to know this. It's a spiritual law. Those who are in Satanism and witchcraft, that's why they do rituals in a location. They're attracting and inviting demons into that place. Are you following me? All right. That's why some people play horrible, de- you know, this death metal music, this demonic music. It attracts evil. Are you following me? So that's so when we're doing holy purposes. We're inviting the presence of God. So those who are, who are in bondage to evil and all that, they're, they're trying to create a portal of evil. In fact, this is so true that if there was a murder that has taken place in a house, the real estate agent has to declare that, has to tell the person who's looking to buy that home. These, this Amityville horror stuff and, and poltergeist, that really happened. That just isn't Hollywood. Wake up, church. Wake up. This stuff happens. So that's why you got to be very careful. The music you're listening to, what you're watching on TV, on the internet, all of these things. Because you are, whether you know it or not, Satan knows it, God knows it, you're creating a portal in your home. You're creating a portal everywhere you go. Are you following me? So evil, worldly music is praise and worship to the devil. You see, that's why the Bible says friendship with the world, you're an adulterer, you're an adulteress. Because we're, as Christians, we're in covenant with God. God takes that seriously. Amen? There is no spouse swapping with God. This is not a spiritual Las Vegas. Are you following me? So you got to be careful because you might be summoning and playing in the wrong kingdom. The enemy knows the power of our words. He knows the power of our actions. He knows the power of music. He knows the power of focus. What humans focus on, they're going to draw. And that's why the enemy is constantly trying to interrupt, affect, and influence those areas of our life. He's trying to stop you from making an open heaven of the glory of God over your life. And by the way, I don't know if you know this or not, but Satan, or Lucifer, was the praise and worship leader in heaven. You think he knows a little something about music and influence? You bet he does. You bet he does. And he's using every bit of that knowledge on earth to shift a generation. Generations. So you better be careful what you're watching and what you're listening to. So don't be deceived. Listen, music, how many, you ever figure that out? Music can shift an atmosphere, doesn't it? It influences people for good or for evil. Amen? I'm telling you right now, it's, 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 it's crazy, but it's true. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. 2 Chronicles 5, 11 through 14. 
This is like one of my favorite, most favorite accounts in the Word of God. I love it. And it came to pass, when the priest came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. Interesting. Unity. And the Levites, who were with the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps. It was a praise team. And with them, 120 priests. Isn't that crazy? 120 is a popular number. The upper room, sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass. Listen, when the trumpeteers and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, the glory cloud, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house. Listen to this. An invitation brings a manifestation or a visitation of the glory. I want you to notice that thankfulness, unity, and praising God with spoken words were all involved in this encounter of inviting the glory of God. And listen to this. The glory of God filled a specific location. Say location. Location. Specific location. A move of God always begins, listen, in a specific location. All right, you you getting that? Do I have to keep saying it? Here we go. So listen, invitation brings a visitation. Visitation is not the end goal, though. The end goal is habitation, where the glory of God dwells and doesn't leave. See, a visit says that I'm going to come visit, but I'm going to leave. Our goal is to press in so much, to have a visitation and honor God so much. He says, I want my glory to dwell. I want to make it a habitation. Now you see my message uh, title. Invitation, visitation. We need the habitation. Amen? Now, so we need to create an atmosphere, a habitation, or a home for the glory of God that doesn't leave. A place where it remains. See, once a specific location becomes a habitation rather than a place of visitation, now it becomes holy ground. Say holy ground. Let me give you an example of this. You ready for this? Who has heard of Moravian Falls, North Carolina? She has. Oh, yeah. Quite popular amongst those who are in the prophetic and, you know, miracle signs and wonders things. The Moravian people, listen to this. There is such a residue, glory, presence, power of God on this in this city of Moravian Falls, North Carolina. Do you want to know why? The Moravian people had a prayer meeting on that property that lasted. Are you ready for this? Hold on. One hundred over one hundred years, twenty four seven. The glory is not cheap. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you to press in and want it. Amen. God, I got to have more of you. Amen. To this day, that residue is on there. People, Christians will go to Moravian Falls just to go out and read the word out in the forest by themselves. And and so many have said they, they saw angels out there. Why? Because a portal of glory was created from that prayer meeting and pressing in. I mean, it's good to have God visit, but when it becomes a habitation and it dwells there, the spiritual, you could say this way, the spiritual wells were opened and it became a habitation for the manifest presence and glory of God. Am I talking to any hungry Christians out here? Am I talking to any thirsty Christians that are wanting to press in with me? Come on, somebody. Cities around the United States and world that have experienced uh, several moves of God, they still have a residue 
that will ignite with revival. Let me give you a few. You ready for this? Lakeland, Florida. There's been several uh, moves of God, revival in there, that city. Pensacola, Florida. There, there's a portal over there. Amen? Los Angeles, California. Believe it or not, there is from the Azusa Street revival. We just need some Christians to go in there. Anybody want to hop on a jet today and go to L.A.? Spark some revival? But those are just to name a few. Every area, though, has that potential for a move of God. Amen? But God is needing His people to rise up and ask, to seek, to knock, to hunger for it, to press in for more. Think of it this way. Let me give you something to think about. Every time we pray, every time we praise and worship in a location, every time we gather in one accord, uh, like in the upper room, We are digging a well. We are digging until we hit that gusher, that breakthrough of His presence and glory. We are creating an open heaven, a portal. We are opening the windows of heaven. Some of y'all never heard of this before, but now you have. There's so much more to the Christian life. There's so much more than just going to your secular workplace and, and, and punch a clock, come home, do nothing. Oh, God, time to make the donuts. Gotta go. Are you kidding me? We can take God with us everywhere we go. You can shift atmospheres everywhere you go. Again, let me remind you, nothing in the kingdom of God is random. Someone prayed, someone pressed in, someone paid a spiritual, physical, and emotional price for an awakening, for a revival, and for an outpouring. Ask, seek, and knock must be an active and normal routine in your life for breakthrough to manifest. Don't say one prayer and expect it to happen. Do you Think about it. Do you think the devil really wants... A breakthrough? Do you do you think the devil really wants you to be ripping open the heavens where the glory of God is going to manifest in your life in a place? Absolutely not. He's going to try everything he can do to distract and try to stop. We got to be alert to what he's trying to do. Amen? Amen. So that's why I hope this message is a wake up call for all of us. Like I said, This breakthrough is not just for a local church. We need to dig wells of awakening, revival, and outpouring in our homes, in our schools, cities, counties, in our vehicles. How many of you have seen Facing the Giants, the movie? Do you remember a group of people would go into the school? Was it either every morning or or at the end of the day? They would go in the school and they would pray over the lockers, all of them. Well, in the movie, it sparked a revival in that school. Yeah, I know it's a movie. But that's, that can really happen. Now, we found out that at 3.30 at the high school, it's open for anybody to go in the halls and walk around. I say we have prayer meetings there. Are you following me? What do you think? You think that would make the devil angry? Then let's do it. Amen? From today on, you need to view yourself as a spiritual well digger. It gives you a different mental perspective of what it means to advance the kingdom of God. Keep digging those wells. Go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. Hallelujah. A good rule of thumb is if it makes the devil mad, we want to do it. Yeah, if you will run everything through that, that test, you'll be great. Come on, somebody. Amen. Psalm 95, 1 through 6. Let's take a look at that. It says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the King above all gods. Amen? In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. O come! Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before him, uh, before the Lord, our maker. I love that. Now, anywhere in the word of God. See, we will read through that and it just kind of goes over our head. But I want to give you a new perspective of what this is saying. Anywhere in the word of God where it exhorts, encourages, and ex- instructs us to praise God, to shout unto God. It's revealing a key to attract his manifest presence and glory. It is instructing us how to shift a, an atmosphere. 
It's instructing us how to create a breakthrough. It is an invitation to the Holy Spirit to not just visit, but to dwell in that place. So this passage is, uh, tells us to sing and shout joyfully to the Lord and to come before His presence in thanksgiving. So here's what it is. Thanksgiving is praising God. Amen? So here's what, so praise is this. Praise is a magnification of God. It is a lifting Him up. It is a, an exalting Him. It's a focusing on Him. Amen? Now listen to this. It says this, come before his presence with thanksgiving. I read that, I read that, and I was just like, oh, okay. And then the Holy Spirit said, no, read it again. Look at this, look at it again. Come before, before, before his presence comes, there must be thanksgiving. If you're not thankful, forget it. Forget experiencing the manifest presence and glory of God in your life. Come before His presence. Your thanksgiving must come before His presence comes. His presence will not manifest until we first verbalize our thankfulness to Him with singing, shouting, a breaking through with force. Now, as you can see, Singing and shouting. It's interesting it talks about that, right? Singing and shouting, you must put an effort into it, right? It's a shouting. Are you following me? It's putting something into it because we're trying to break through. Are you following me? So singing and shouting will will help with that breakthrough. Come on, somebody. Go to Psalm 91. So don't forget this. Our singing and shouting then, according to this passage... Our singing and shouting to the Lord. What are we supposed to sing? What are we supposed to shout? This. They should be words that are filled with thankfulness to God. It's interesting that in the last days, that many, it says, are going to be what? Unthankful. Unthankful. Psalm 91. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Here we go. Psalm 91, 1 and 2. It says, He who dwells... In the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that beautiful? I will say, say, say of the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. I just want to stop right there. But we are, when we are verbally thanking and praising God for His promises, when we're in faith doing that, we are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. That's why it says the tongue can ignite evil in your life. Are you hearing me? What's coming out of your mouth? Because your mouth can either keep you in or take you out of that secret place. And that secret place ultimately is in Christ. If you're in Christ, it's going to show through the words of your mouth. Are you following me? Look at this. The psalmist makes all of these faith-filled confessions here in Psalm 91. And then in verse 14, there is a switch Have you ever noticed that? So all the way 1 1 through 13, it's the the psalmist making positive, faith-filled confessions about God. And then verse 14 is a switch. It says this, God starts talking now. It says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Set him on high. He will call upon me and I will answer him, deliver him, and give him long life. The entire key to all of those blessings in Psalm 91 is you could break it down to this. Ready? Setting or focusing your love upon God. If your love is not upon Him, forget the benefits of Psalm 91 in your life. So all y'all are wondering, why am I getting attacked so bad? Has you, is, have you taken your love, your focus off of Him and on something else? Because that'll do it. No idols. No distractions, simply making Jesus Christ your priority. Number one. He's number one. Everything else under your life has to go through the filter of Jesus, through the filter of the Word of God. Are you following me? No idols. Idols got to be kicked over. They got to be burned, baby. If you want Psalm 91 results, your love, your focus needs to be set on Him alone because He is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. Amen? Amen. I feel fire on that. That focused love will bring a breakthrough. It will birth a a move of God in your life. 
So here's what you need to do. You got to make sure your love is a laser, not a floodlight. It's laser focused on God. Laser focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. A thankful heart, listen, is making room for the presence of God, not only in their own life, but in a specific location. See, when we gather and there's unity, there's a love, a crying out for God, God says, that's a place I want to visit, and that's a place, if they will maintain that, if they will maintain that, I want to make it a habitation. And this place will be a center for revival in this region like never before. That's why we're drawing people. They're hungry for more of God. Amen? And God is rewarding us with that because we are focusing on Him. We are word-driven. We're presence-driven. We want to connect with His heart. Amen? Amen? A heart and words of thankfulness releases a blessing. You know, what kept coming to me was blessing when we pray over our food. Yes. What, are we, what are we doing? We're being thankful for it. Thank you, Lord, for this food, right? And it releases a blessing. Thankfulness releases a blessing. Yes. Having a thankful heart. Listen means that you have a proper perspective of who God truly is. If you have a thankful heart, your perspective has shifted. If you don't have a thankful heart, your perspective has shifted from something other than the Word of God. Because there's no way in hell that you can't read all the promises in the Word and not be thankful. It takes a demonic blindness to keep someone from having a thankful heart. So if you're not thankful, you're not getting into the Word. And the Word's not getting into you. Psalm 95 instructs us to worship Him, listen, by bowing down and kneeling to Him. It it is an outward expression of an inward attitude or perspective. Some people get all bent out of shape when someone, you know, if if they come and they, they kneel or lay on the ground. Some people think, oh, they're just making a show. No, 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 no. It's an inward, uh, it's an inward attitude that's expressing itself outwardly. Go to John chapter four real quick. We need to be pressing in for the manifest presence and glory of God. That's why, that's why when the glory of God manifests someone, I mean, you can go to counseling for 30, 40 years, but when the glory hits someone, it's a moment changed. It's like a flash, an encounter with your creator. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. John 4, 23 through 24, I'm finishing up here, stick with me. And it says this, but the hour is coming and now is. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. I like what the King James says better. God is a spirit. God, see, a lot of New Agers take this. Oh, God's spirit. Oh, the universe. You following me? No, God is a spirit. He's personal being. Are you following me? God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus said the true worshipers of God are to worship him in spirit and truth. All right? So there must be some false worship then. Are you following me? So worship is the attitude and posture of the heart that's bent toward God. Say bent toward God. I like that phrase, bent toward God. Don't you? It doesn't mean you're never going to mess up, but you're bent toward God. If you mess up, you're going to ask for forgiveness and move, up, repent and move on. Amen? But to be a true worshiper of God, you need to renew your mind with the Word of God so that you know, you know who and why you're worshiping Him. Amen? Worship is obedience as well. Worship is not just song and music and getting on your knee. No, it's an obedience to Him. We'll talk about that at some other time. But the renewed mind... The mind that's renewed with the Word of God will allow your born-again spirit to fully come through to worship God. Because the real born-again you wants to worship God. You know that, right? Here it is. So worship, it's an again, it's an outward expression of an inward attitude and perspective of who God really is. If you really know who He is, you're going to want to worship Him, trust me. If you don't, you have no clue, that's why you're not. There might be some idols in your life that you're worshiping, right? So remember, I said a couple of weeks ago that our physical body is simply a glove for our spirit man. I like that picture. Don't you? I like that. So your physical body, listen to this, is going to do what the real you, your spirit man, tells it to do. Oh, someone's getting it. 
through the filter of your soul, mind, will, and emotions. So all of the instructions of how to praise and worship God outwardly come from your spirit and soul that's within your physical body. That's why it says to kneel. So worship is not just a spiritual thing. It's also a physical thing. A lifting hands, a kneeling, a bowing down. Are you following me? So what's in your heart is going to come forward through your physical body. That's why evil comes from what's on the inside. If your life is a mess right now, you're into, you know, you're drinking, you're having premarital sex and all this stuff. Well, that's coming out through your glove of what's in your heart. It all, everything comes down to the heart. Say heart. heart. So if you're joyful, thankful, and in awe of God, it's going to be manifested in your outward actions. Amen. All right. Here we go. Almost done. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to keep going then. All right, here we go. You guys have no place else to go, right? All right, here we go. So that is why we open the altar. All right, here. The altar is always open for you to have a personal encounter with God for yourself. To overcome the embarrassment of coming out of the pew. Because it is. I mean, I get it. I've been there when I first got saved and there would be altar calls. You know, you're kind of... You know, sitting there, people are like, oh, and you're like, I don't know, I'm a little embarrassed. Why, every, you know, everyone's up at the altar. What's there to be embarrassed about, right? But even if nobody is up there, it's a thing between you and God. Amen? So that is why the Holy Spirit touches people in a powerful way at the altar. It's an act of faith. It's an act of worship to God. And he will respond to that action every time. Why? Because you're drawing nigh to him and he draws nigh to you. You're putting a spiritual law into action. Amen? So get over yourselves. Amen? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty from yourself. There is liberty in this church because the Holy Spirit is manifesting His presence. Amen? So we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. In true worship, your heart is truly engaged. I like that. And we worship worship in truth knowing who He is. We're not worshiping a God that we're making up in our own mind. Are you following me? That's called idolatry. But we're worshiping the true God. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen? Worship is a focus on God. It is a connecting with His heart and draws and causes the Holy Spirit to manifest His presence. Praise and worship. You want to break open the heavens in your home? Turn on praise music and start praise and worshiping God. Start singing to Him. It will open up a portal of glory in that home. Come on, somebody. And again, so again, praise is magnification of God. It lifts him up. It exalts him. It's an admiration of him. Last of all, there's one more passage I want to bring up and I'm done. Go to Isaiah chapter six. I want to look at one more pack passage that talks about the effect of a supernatural encounter in the manifest presence and glory of God. Isaiah chapter six. This is very important. So we know what we're seeking now, right? We know what we need to press in for. And how will we know when we get it? Well, this will be evident. Here we go. (laughs) Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And it stood, above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And he cried to another and said, listen to what they said. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's the perspective we need to have in this life. And the, and the post of the doors of the door were shaken. By the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke, or a cloud, or the glory. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said these words, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying this, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Us, us, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Did you ever see that? Who will go for us? Then I said... Here I am, send me. 
Isaiah had a supernatural encounter with the Lord in the glory, or smoke as it said, or or a cloud as other passages describe it. It filled the place, and seraphim, seraphim are referred to as burning ones, ministering spirits of God. Amen? Now, and they're connected to purity, by the way. Wherever the presence or the manifest presence or the glory of God is manifesting, there's seraphim in the house. And there's other angels moving around. So now, Isaiah's encounter in the glory shifted and corrected Isaiah's perspective. He didn't think he, uh, he didn't think he was dirty and filthy. He didn't think that there was anything wrong with his life until the glory manifested. We think we're doing good. We think we're doing everything right. But until we have an encounter in the glory, that is when revival hits. And that's why one of the first things that happens is a repentance. Isaiah the prophet said, oh, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. What do you mean, Isaiah? I mean, you lived holy, right? You did. But not in the glory. Don't think you're all that in a bag of chips. Talk to me after that encounter in the glory. That's why when the glory manifests, it is the, one of the fruit of it is a repentance. A cr- Lord, I'm sorry for doing this. Lord, I need to get back in line with you. That's what the glory does. That's what an encounter in the glory does. The holiness of God, the fear of the Lord are magnified in our thought life. We desire to have radical obedience to the Word of God and specific instructions from the Holy Spirit. This is the last page, I promise, guys, right there. And last of all, here's the last thing I wanted to say. An encounter in the glory will cause you to get busy for the Lord. God asked, who's going to go for me? And Isaiah said, send me. I'm going to go. A true encounter and experience with God will motivate you to get busy for God and advance His kingdom. That is how an awakening and outpouring and a revival spills out to other locations from one location. Church, we need to continually ask, seek, and knock for a move of God until it happens. We must never stop digging spiritual wells everywhere we go. Amen? Amen. So this is how I want to end it. Never stop the, the invitation process. Never reject the visitation. And always strive to make your life and everywhere you go a habitation for the glory and power of God. Let's stand in this place. Thanks for listening to the Revival Now podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and download the Luke 418 Radio Network app at Luke418Radio.com. I'll be back next week for another anointed and life-changing Revival Now podcast.